Today, we're going to focus on some of the major principles of science and what science really is. In doing so, I want to start by asking you a question. In this picture, you see two fish. Some of you, maybe if you know fish around our local area, might know. Uh, the larger fish is a sheep's head, and the smaller fish right near its head is called a pork fish. It's actually a juvenile pork fish. Now, if you were swimming along, uh, either scuba diving or snorkeling, and you happen to see this situation, what might you think of it? The first thing I might do if I was studying behavior would be to take a picture or video of it, in this case, just a still picture. This would allow me to study it and analyze it a little bit later on. So now I'm back at the lab. I'm looking at this image. I'm trying to decide what is going on between these two fish. What kind of a relationship are they demonstrating? Think about it for a few minutes and jot down a few possible explanations. If you need a little bit more time, just go ahead and press pause. Otherwise, let's continue. The first question you might ask is, is this a predatory prey relationship? Just because there's a vastly different size between the two fish. If you look closely, however, there are clues that would dismiss this particular answer. If you look, the sheep's head's mouth is facing kind of downward, not towards the small pork fish. And the pork fish itself is actually facing the larger sheep's head, almost touching it between the eyes and definitely not trying to run away. So if it's not a predatory prey relationship, why else would these two fish be so close together? What benefit would there actually be? The next very important step you wanna take is to actually do research. Other scientists most likely have studied this in other parts of the world or even in your same local area. By researching this and talking to other scientists, you're relying on that scientific community, which is so important. By doing so, you'll probably find out that some fish, especially when they're juveniles or small, will have a mutualistic relationship with larger fish, and they will clean parasites off those larger fish. This explanation would fit the initial observations from this particular image that we're looking at. But it's not completely conclusive. What will we need to do to further support this predicted outcome? If you said further experimentation, you're correct. You could design a series of experiments that would gather more observational data that would give more insight into the situation. This might also open up a whole other field of study because I would want to know what specific parasites might these juvenile pork fish be going after? Do they have a preference of a particular type of fish that they service? Are there specific reef structures that promote these types of relationships? Do sheep's head have preferences to what type of fish clean them? I literally could go on and on and on. And that is exactly what scientists do. Scientific research might start with a specific observation but it can expand really quickly. So we always want to check out the significant ideas before we get really into the notes. We have three for this particular note set. The first is that the process of scientific inquiry includes the formation of testable hypotheses, the design of an experiment to collect appropriate data, the evaluation of that data, and communicating those results through peer-reviewed publications, or basically to the rest of the scientific community. Next, you should understand that a theory is a well-substantiated explanation of an aspect of the natural world that's been repeatedly tested and confirmed through observation and experimentation. And finally, the reliability of data should be evaluated considering the sources of uncertainty within the data collection. Next, you will also see a set of learning goals. These are reflected on the learning skills given to you in class. These goals are specific and targeted and will help you study for exams. So what is science to begin with? 
The word itself comes from Latin, scientia, which translates to knowledge. So science is this systematic and logical approach to discovering how things in the universe work through testing and analysis. Now to say how things work in the universe might seem huge and abstract compared to your normal life here on Earth. But remember, we are all part of the universe, and the physical laws that govern all of that also affects us here on Earth and allows us to, for example, have electricity flowing through our lines into our house and running our appliances. So let's delve a little bit deeper into what science really is. First, science asks questions about the natural world. These questions can be just like what we uh, worked with on the picture of the two fish. Uh, it can also be more practical, like how do we reduce uh, the heat transfer within a microchip to increase processing speeds. At the end of the day, science aims to provide accurate explanations and reliable predictions. That means that whatever we study and learn about, our hypotheses and our eventual theories should be able to produce accurate predictions of specific phenomena. And science is limited. We can only work with testable ideas. And we have to rely on evidence, not what we consider dogma or popular culture or opinion or tradition or things that really don't provide concrete evidence. The scientific community really provides a set of checks and balances for this, because when scientists finish a study, they have to publish this in peer-reviewed journals, and that means that they are actually evaluated by other scientists, their peers, and it is determined whether a particular study was unbiased, was adhered to various protocols, had controlled variables, whatever those cases may be, to make sure that it's actually reliable science. And just like I mentioned after we got towards the end of our discussion about the two fish, there are so many possibilities within any study. As soon as you start to ask one question, other questions come up very quickly. So now let's look at the term hypothesis. As stated, a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a fairly narrow set of phenomena usually based on prior experience, scientific knowledge, background knowledge, and preliminary observations, as well as logic. Just like the example with the two fish at the beginning of the lecture, if you go out and do the research, you might find others have an explanation or at least a proposed explanation for a particular phenomena then you might go, okay, well, I kind of think it might be a little different, so I'm going to test it in my own way and try and figure this out. That's where hypotheses come into play. They start with an observation, then you ask that question based on the observation, you go to background information to find out what other scientists have published and learned about over the years, and then you take that next step. Now, of course, there's some big misconceptions out in popular culture about a hypothesis, and most people relate this to some sort of wild guess that really has no relevance. But as you can see from our example and, and probably your own experiences, they're more than that. They're not just stabs in the dark. The reality is a hypothesis is based on experience, past scientific knowledge, and it has explanatory power. They can predict outcomes. Now, of course, the trick is how well do they predict outcomes? How accurately do they predict things? That's when we start to dismiss or accept or you know, reject hypotheses. So let's break down a hypothesis. This year, you'll be using the if-then-because framework to develop your hypotheses. Now, this is kind of like training wheels to scientists because hypotheses do not always have to be in this format but it's a good place to start. And it highlights the fact that you're going to use specific variables. For example, if the independent variable, which is the variable you're manipulating, is manipulated in whatever way, then 
what's going to happen to your dependent variable? And then, of course, why is it going to happen? That is the basic framework for a hypothesis statement. Remember that a hypothesis has explanatory power. It's trying to tell you why it thinks something is going to occur the way it's going to occur. The example below states if the surface area is increased, then salt will dissolve faster because it will have more contact with the solvent per unit of surface area. In this example, we're basically looking at the size of salt grains. If they're small salt grains or if they're big rock salt. The larger the chunk of salt, the less surface area per unit volume you have. And thus water, which of course dissolves the salt, has less access. Thus, the dissolving is going to be slower. Reversely, if the salt grains are very small, they have a very high surface area to volume ratio, and thus the solvent, water, is going to act on them much more quickly. This is an example of a hypothesis with explanatory power. Now let's get into the concept of a theory. A theory is a broad natural explanation for a wide range of phenomena. They generally develop over a long period of time and help us understand major concepts within biology, physics, chemistry, you name it. They have predictive power that allows us to confirm by observing what happens in reality. And they help us explain what's going on. Now, there's much more to theories than that simple definition. Theories are concise, they're coherent, they make sense, they're systematic, they are predictive. They generally integrate multiple hypotheses and are supported by many different lines of empirical evidence, meaning that we don't just rely on one source of information or data to confirm a theory. Theories are not unchangeable. If new evidence comes up, usually because we're able to collect data in new ways, they might mo that data might modify a current theory or even overturn it. Having said that, it is very rare that a theory is completely overturned. Theories are really substantive and well-documented, well-researched, and tend to make very accurate predictions. Most likely, new evidence will modify a theory more than it will overturn it. Unfortunately, the general public uses the term theory like it's something that's very unreliable. This could not be farther from the truth. In reality, a theory is one of the most accepted explanations based on extensive experimentation, multiple lines of empirical evidence, when the scientific community comes into consensus about an actual theory, it's not a trivial thing. Examples of theories are like the theory of evolution, the atomic theory, quantum theory, theory of plate tectonics. These are all things that have been well documented and have very accurate predictions of outcomes that we commonly see in our everyday lives. So when somebody says, oh, it's just a theory, they obviously don't understand the weight of the term theory. Now, to be honest, science does not prove things to an accuracy of 100%. Generally, we work off probabilities, and we're going to get into that later on in the course. But there's a term called scientific law that most people will get confused about. A scientific law is a generalization about empirical data that we constantly observe but it doesn't have the explanatory power that a theory does. A classic example of this would be the law of gravity. Most people would agree if you throw something up, it's going to come back down here on Earth. Now, that's just an Earth-based example. You can get into more complex things, but you get the idea. Just like anything else, scientific law can be rejected or modified based on new empirical data. And again, they're generally descriptive, not explanatory, and there are some examples there on the screen. Now, I've been mentioning this thing called empirical data for most of this talk. The term empirical comes from the Greek word for experience, empiria. 
and it's derived or acquired through observation and experimentation. This is important because you're going to be dealing with a lot of data, empirical data or knowledge throughout this course. Now, anytime you're collecting data, you're probably collecting some sort of measurement, and there are a ton of different tools you can use to do so. However, data collection and measurement in general can vary based on a lot of different factors. There can be things like human error, where you read the numbers wrong, or possibly there's a factor or a variable in the room that's maybe controlling something like uh, temperature or humidity. You could have forgotten to calibrate one of the digital instruments, and so the measurements are off. There are just numerous things that could go wrong. Either way, we have to deal with uncertainty, and uncertainty is defined as a quantitative measurement of variability in the data. We can categorize it in two ways, through accuracy and precision. Accuracy is basically how close the measurement is to the true or known value. This correct value is often used to sort of calibrate instruments. If you actually know something, for example, is five grams in mass and you put it on a scale and you get five grams, then you know your scale is ready to go. Another way to look at it is the bullseyes listed at the bottom of the screen. If you notice the bullseyes that actually have the green check for accuracy, you'll notice that the hits are very close to the center or the true value or the correct value that we're looking for. In the case for the bullseye on the far right, they're definitely in the very center. Now, precision is a little different. It's how close the measurements are to each other. For example, the two middle bullseyes have hits that are very much spread out. That means that they are not very precise at all. Meanwhile, the two bullseyes on the far right and the far left are very precise. All of the hits are very clustered together in one spot. Now you might notice you can be precise but not accurate. And you can also be accurate and not precise. As scientists, we try and decrease uncertainty. We do this in a number of ways. First of all, we try and choose the most appropriate equipment to collect the data that we are trying to access. For example, if you want to measure volume, you want to use the smallest beaker needed for the volume you're actually measuring. If you're measuring the length of your fingernail, you might want to use millimeters instead of meters because meters are kind of big. You also want to make sure that you're using the equipment correctly and properly. For example, if it needs to be calibrated, you calibrate before you start collecting data. You want to obviously control all the variables that have nothing to do with the direct experiment that you're dealing with or that independent variable. And of course, finally, you want to make sure this is a repeatable experiment. That will allow other scientists to verify your research. Learning how to deal with data and making sure your data is accurate and you have integrity within the procedures and the process that you're going through is very important to science. Flaws in your methodology could lead to inaccurate conclusions. This could cause you or others to make a poor decision when managing natural resources, for example. It could lead to spending a lot of money to try and fix a problem the wrong way and have to go back to the drawing board later. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is personal bias can invalidate research. If you go in expecting a result and determined to find that result, a lot of times you can sort of make that happen. And that really is kind of bad science. So it's up to all of us to protect the integrity of science. And first of all, you got to take into account that scientists are human beings and we're prone to mistakes. So it's really important that we rely on empirical data that's gathered by multiple scientists independently replicating experiments. This helps 
create a system of checks and balances. No one experiment will ever prove a hypothesis. It can only support or refute it. Scientists must share their data and their methodologies and conclusions so others can read them, peer review them, and sometimes retest them. This helps to assure the integrity of the scientific community and our own scientific advancement over time. Respect the science. So now I turn it over to you for your in-depth question. We've talked a lot about how, what science is and how it works. Think about the limitations of science. I want you to list what are some of the things that science can't answer kind of a difficult question and we'll talk about it in class. So until next time, keep thinking.